Heavenly Father, hallelujah, Jesus Christ has indeed risen, and we serve a risen Savior. We thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through him. We thank you for your gift of your Holy Spirit that leads and guides and directs us. And we thank you for the many blessings which you give to us each and every day. We thank you for the opportunity just to gather here this morning freely while others around the world have to celebrate your resurrection in hidden places in secret. And Lord, we just pray for our brothers and sisters around the world in those situations that you would continue to strengthen and guide them just as you continue to strengthen and guide us. Lord, you are the great physician and there are many in need of, of a touch of your healing, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, Lord. You know all things. You know the needs that we could take time and, and list. Lord, I just, I just pray that you would just touch those in need of, of your touch. We pray for encouragement for those that need encouragement. We pray for physical healing for those that need physical healing. We pray for a sound mind for those that, that are struggling with mental issues. And Lord, we pray for protection from the evil one who, who seeks to destroy our brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we just pray for our government. We pray for our local leaders, our state leaders, and our, our national leaders. Lord, there are many things we hear on the news and we think we know how to solve all these problems, but Lord, you are in control ultimately. So Lord, we just pray for your guidance and your wisdom to fall upon those in leadership that, that are more in control of these circumstances. We pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would, would guide us and how we should live as your children. We pray for those that are serving in the medical community, those that are serving in the military, those that are first responders that respond in crisis situations. We pray that you would give protection and wisdom. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us now as, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word. May we let it penetrate into our beings that we would want to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I, I do want to remind you that they, we have numerous ways that you can give of your tithes and offerings. Um, there's a drop box in the back of the sanctuary that you are free to drop your offering in. If you are watching at home, we do offer online giving. And I just want to thank everyone for your generosity as we use these gifts to minister here at Prince Street Church. Thank you. 
Well, happy Easter, Prince Street Church. We're glad you could be here this morning, whether here in person, the sanctuary, or watching online. Uh, if this is your first time here in a while, or first time here ever, uh, my name is Pastor John Shadle. I'm blessed to be the senior pastor here at Prince Street Church, and we're glad they can join us uh, here this morning. Um, I'd like to start off the sermon time uh, asking you if you would uh, to just stand if you're able to. Uh, of course, even at home, feel free to stand if you're able to. It may be awkward if you're at home, but still stand. Um, but I just want to do something that uh, takes us back in history a couple thousand years ago. Uh, there's a tradition, of course, at the early church that dates all the way back to the early Christians. That the first Christians, when they would greet each other, whether it was in, uh, in a service like this or walking down the streets, one of them would say, of course, we've already done this this morning, Christ is risen, and the other would say in response, if they believed it, that he is risen indeed. Uh, and that's because this was the central part of what they understood what Christians' truth to be all about. It's about the resurrection from the dead. Uh, this was the center of their confession. It was the center of their belief. When we confess that today, we are confessing something that Christians have believed consistently for 2,000 years. And there really is not a lot that you could say it hasn't changed in 2,000 years, let alone from generation to generation. But when you and I say this, if we believe it, we are connecting ourselves to the core of what Christians have believed for consistently for 2,000 years. And I think it's a perfect thing for us to reflect on and understand and do again uh, this morning. So, again, we've already done it again this morning, but we'll do it again right now. Uh, Christ is risen. All right, you may be seated. And this is, I believe, the most important day on the Christian calendar and addresses one of the most widespread myths about Christianity in our culture today. You know, it's really natural for people in our culture to want to kind of divorce the moral teachings of Jesus, which they appreciate and admire from his supernatural life. You know, people are like, you know, Jesus, he's awesome. You know, he forgave adulterers. You know, that's, that's so nice that he did that. Uh, he was against big religion and the Roman Empire, and he, he stuck up for the poor. Again, go Jesus, you know, that Sermon on the Mount, you know, that brings tears to my eyes. But when you get to the part about him rising from the dead, being Savior for those who call him Lord, you know, well, I, I'm not so sure about that. But here, here's the problem, though, with those, with those thoughts. You know, the Apostle Paul said that the resurrection is not true, then everything else that Christianity teaches is, is worthless. Uh, people may say, well, you know, that's Paul's opinion. I just accept the parts of Christianity about God being love and how we should love and forgive. And then I reject just the rest. Okay, but to those, those people, wh where do you learn that God is love and we should forgive each other? For example, you know, everybody loves 1 Corinthians 13, read at their weddings. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. You know, guess who wrote that? Paul. Paul did. You know, that was not a common view of relationships at the time. In the Paul's day, it was not love and forgiveness that was important, but honor and retribution. And Paul said that the resurrection didn't happen. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 is useless. So you don't believe in the res resurrection, quit reading that at your wedding. Oh, again, what about God is love? Well, where'd you learn that? Well, my, from my grandmother. Well, where, where'd she get that? Well, probably 1 John uh, 4.18. Again, this was not a common belief in the ancient world that God's defining, defining characteristic was love. The Apostle Paul who wrote that was said that God is love also said that anyone who denies the resurrection of Jesus is a liar and false prophet. Again, do you see the dilemma? Everything people appreciate about Jesus came from people who believed that he rose from the dead and who said that the resurrection is not true. Everything else about this is false. And so in light of all that, I want to share with you just a short parable that Jesus told a group of people. It's one of the most famous short stories in the world. And actually, Charles Dickens called it the, the finest short story ever written. But I don't want you to hear it as a, a quaint story this morning. I want you to hear it as the truth. This is a story that Jesus told that summarized his whole life. A life whose defining moment was the death and resurrection that we are celebrating today. Again, it's the story of the prodigal son. And so we are in Luke uh, 15, verses 11 through 32 this morning. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. Or smartphones, you can bring it up on the uh, smartphones. 
Um, I'm going to read the story at first uh, before we break the story down and just dig deep into some observations that I have on the passage. So feel free to follow along as I read through the whole story together. I'm not going to have that on the screen. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, um, feel free. Again, this is just an opportunity. Just maybe just to close your eyes as I read through the the parable, just so you have the opportunity to have God maybe speak to you or challenge you to, to what God really has in store for you this morning. So feel free, again, read along with me or close your eyes and have me just read Uh, the parable to you. So here is in Luke 15 verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his his sense, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will get out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, You know, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property of prostitutes come home, You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of the Lord. Before digging into the passage, let me set the stage of what's going on here. Of course, this story is commonly called the story of the prodigal son, and there are three main characters in this story. Of course, you have the, the younger son, who's usually referred to as the prodigal. Uh, you have you got the older son, and he actually has a very, very important role uh, in this story. And you, of course, you have the father. But here are a couple things that people usually get wrong about this story. First, they think the main character is actually the runaway son. But the, actually, the, the main character of this parable is the father. You know, he's actually mentioned no less than 12 times in the span of 20 verses. The younger son is only mentioned just a few times in this, this passage. It is the father who is the main character, not, not the son. Second, when we think the word prodigal, it means the word runaway. But actually the word prodigal in English means reckless or wasteful. It means to spend until you have nothing left. The word prodigal actually only appears one time in the story as a reference to some blowing all his money. And I'm going to show that when you see the bigger point in the story, the word prodigal probably better applies to the father than the son because the story is truly about the the recklessness of God's love for us. And so as we walk through this story together, I'm going to highlight the love of the father being spoken about through this entire parable. So, so let's dig in as we walk through just a couple verses here at a time. 
if I can go. It's not working for me up there. Can you move on to the next slide for me? I blame I broke it. I probably broke it. So. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll figure it out. So anyways, first two verses, 11 through 12, says, Jesus continued, there is a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. The younger son wants his dad's money, but he no longer wants him. It's hard to imagine anything more painful for a dad, for his son to say, you know, my preference would be for you to just die so I can have your money but since this isn't happening, I just wanted to take that stuff and just go away from you. You know, I, I can't imagine anything more painful than I would experience him for my son Isaac to one day say to me, you know, I have no desire for a relationship with you. I, I don't want to be around you. I don't want my kids to actually know who you are. Just give us your money and get out of our lives. Okay, not much in my life would cause me as much pain as that. In this part of the story, Jesus is giving us a picture of what sin is like. Something all of us have participated in to some level. We don't really want God in our lives. We don't want his control, his rules. We don't value or feel like we need his love. You know, I've heard sin be called the, uh, the big I problem. You know, I, of course, is that middle letter of the word. It basically means that I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. I want to be the point. You know, people think of sin as, as these terrible moral acts, and it includes that, but it's in essence, essence is that I want to be my own master. That's what sin is all about. And that can't happen when God is around. So I'll just ignore God, and for all practical purposes, God is dead to me. You know, I, I have no relationship with him. So here in these couple of verses, Jesus has given us a picture of what sin is, something that all of us have in our lives. Now come, here comes the first major surprise of this story, is that, uh, so he divided his property between them, the second part of verse 12. You know, why is this surprising? Well, a father in that day would not have acted like this at all. The book of Leviticus actually says that you could have a rebellious son like this executed, killed, murdered for doing this. Uh, New Testament scholar Kenneth Bailey says, actually, first century Jewish custom dictated that if a Jewish boy rejected the family, the community would break a large pot in front of him and cry out, so-and-so is cut off from his people. And this ceremony was called the kezabah, literally meaning cutting off, and after it was performed, the community would have nothing to do with, the, with this wayward person. And that's the expectation of everyone that's hearing this story for the first time. And this is how the story should go down. This is actually what justice is. But this brings me to my first point that I want to share today, is that God loves you even when you rejected him and broke his heart. Again, God loves you even when you rejected him and broke his heart. Again, before you repented, before you wanted to come back to him, God set his love on you. He never stopped loving you. And at that moment that you were rebelling against him, maybe that's even going on right now in your life, but there's never been a point where God has stopped loving you. He loves you even when you've rejected him and broke his heart. And God loves you even when you've rejected him and broke his heart. Right, verses 13 through 16. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild or, or prodigal living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This brings me to my second point this morning, is that God loves you even as you wander in the darkness. Again, God loves you even when you wander 
in the darkness. Again, this guy's free life started off great. He went to the far country, away from the father, away from the rules, and he got everything that a lot of money could buy. But then the winds changed. The money was gone. The friends were gone. There was loneliness. There was begging. There was despair. The journey ends with him taking the lowest job in Israel, feeding pigs, which were considered unclean animals, and so hungry that he craves the filthy slop that they eat. You know, this gives us a picture of the trajectory of sin, doesn't it? It usually actually starts great. In the book of Hebrews, it says that there actually is, there is pleasure in sin. There is a pleasure in it. There is a, a fun to it. But the second part of that verse says that there is pleasure in sin for a season. It begins, it begins fun, but ends in darkness. Maybe you are someone currently wandering in the darkness. Some of you may be there. Maybe it's in the darkness, in the pain of, of sexual sin. Maybe you're in the, the pigsty of broken relationships. Or, or maybe you've lost your family or you're in debt. Uh, maybe it's the darkness of a secret sin that you've never confessed that's just eating you alive. Or it could be a path that you chose that promised so much, but it hasn't led where it promised. And maybe that's where you are this morning. You're, maybe you're in that far country. If that is you, you need to remember that God loves you during all of that as well. You see, you should think of this story as if you're watching a split screen. On one side is the son and his reckless living. On the other is the never stopping, never giving up love of the father. When you are reading the story, you tend to forget about the father, even right at the beginning. But you can't because throughout this whole journey, he's watching, he's waiting, never ceasing to stop loving this boy. Again, God loves you even when you wander in the darkness. Verses 17 through 20. When he came to his senses, which when he finally woke up, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while it was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. But while he was still a long way off, again, you know what that means? It means that the father has been watching this whole time. Ever since his son left, he never ceased a daily to look out from where he was to see if his son was coming home. And this brings me to my third point this morning, is that God loves you as he brings you back. God loves you as he brings you back. And let me point out something that you may not have noticed. It looks like the son is the one who's deciding to come back. But this is actually the third story in a row in Luke 15 that Jesus is talking about finding something that is lost. You have to put them all together to get the full impact of what he's trying to teach. And the first one was about a lost sheep. A guy had a hundred sheep, and one was lost. You know, he didn't rejoice in the 99, but he went after the lost one. Then he tells a story about a lost coin. A woman had ten coins, and she lost one somewhere in her house. She didn't rejoice that she still had the nine. She went through the whole house, pull, pulling up cushions, trying to find it until she finally found that one lost coin. In those days, as you interpret those stories, you see that they are actually increasing in value in what the person is looking for. You go from a sheep to a, a very valuable coin. And as you see in an increase of value, you also see that the person gets more and more desperate. You know, you may not connect with either of those, a coin or a, or a sheep, uh, you know what it's like to maybe lose $20 in your wallet. You know, you search through all your pants, but $20 will not break you, but you want to find it. How about when you lose a credit card? Again, you know that feeling of panic when you can't find that credit card. Maybe you're not content with the other six that you have in your wallet. 
but you, you don't rejoice in the six you have. You have to find the one that is lost. But the climax of Jesus' trilogy is the last one, the story of your lost son. And if you're anxious maybe to find some money or a lost sheep, you're desperate to find a lost son. Especially as you go from 100 to 10 to just 2. You know, my little Isaac, my son Isaac, he's 15 months actually today. He's not walking on his own yet, so he's hard to lose. <laughs> Uh, but I can only imagine what it would feel like if I couldn't find him in a store or an amusement park. It would be terrible. And this is the kind of desperation that God feels for the one that is lost. And he actually is the one that is doing the seeking. You don't see it illustrated much in this story, but just like in the other stories, the father is the one doing the seeking. The Apostle John uh, explains that when we, when we come to the Father, we come to the Father as he draws us to him. He is the one that arranges the circumstances of, of your life, and he's working through all kinds of things in your life to draw, him, draw you back to him. Maybe it's through pain. Maybe a broken marriage or a failed career. Maybe something you thought was secure is, failing, is falling apart. Maybe you've started to look at your family, your kids are getting older, and you want to give them a strong foundation. Maybe it's the scare of death. You have, maybe you've had a health scare. And that's, you know, those are things that God is using to draw, him, draw you back to him. C.S. Lewis in his book series, The Chronicles of Narnia, he has a, a boy that's running away, through, uh, but throughout the journey he hears footsteps. And actually he hears an occasional roar in the distance from Aslan, who's a lion, who's the Christ figure in this book. And Lewis actually uses that to explain how God pursued him. He says this in the book of The Problem of Pain. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience. But shouts in our pain it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's because he loves us that God uses the pain and even other circumstances in our lives to draw us back to him. What the story tells us and the other lost stories is that God is seeking us when we are lost. That God is sweeping the house and searching the parts of the mountain where the sheep might be lost because he's trying to bring you back and he's whispering you to your, you in your pleasures. He's whispering to you in your family. He's whispering to you in the fear of death and screaming at you through your pain. He is loving you as he brings you back to him. Verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. And grown men in those days, they did not run. Even in our own day, grown men don't usually run unless it's for sport. If you see a grown man running through the mall, it's either because he's committed a crime or because someone is trying to commit a crime against him. Again, grown men, do we do not run. And plus, men in those days of stature, in those days, they wore robes. They were not good for running. Uh, no one enters a marathon with a full ankle-length robe. In order to run, you actually had to lift up the front of it and expose his knees, which was actually something considered shameful during that time. But there can be times when an emotion is so dominates your heart that you forget everything, Right? And the father is experiencing that in this moment. That he runs to get his son because his emotions have taken over and someone might actually see him running and yell, you know, that, that's shameful. But the father's response is, I don't care. I have my son back. And again, that reminds me here in verse, the last part of verse 20 here, what he does whenever he gets to his son. He says, he threw his arms around him and kissed him. And this brings me to my fourth point here this morning, is that God loves you as he wraps you in his arms. And God loves you as he wraps you in his arms. And can, have you ever had this moment when suddenly in your spirit that something is telling you that even though you've walked away from, from God, that God's voice whispers to you the tenderness of his love, telling you that though you've run away, he's never given up. That again, that's the Holy Spirit right there. 
Because that is God whispering to you his fatherly love that he has never given up and has watched you the whole time and he is calling you back. If you stop to listen, maybe that's something that God is even telling you that right now through this story. Because that is what this whole story is about. I know it's hard to process, but the, the infinite mind of God, when he first told this story, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about your life and your far country. He was thinking about your brokenness, and he was drawing you back, and he runs to you out to embrace you, and he loves you as he wraps you in his arms. It's the way that how much God really loves each one of us. Verse 21. The son has said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, again, it's interesting. Do you notice that the, he, the son never got through his prepared speech in this? That he planned to tell his dad about his plan to become a servant and work off his debt? But his dad cuts him off and he says this to his servants. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Again, God loves you as he baptizes you with grace and makes all things new. God loves you as he baptizes you with grace and makes all things new. The Father here gives him three gifts. The robe, again, not just any robe, but the best robe. And the best robe would have belonged to the Father. The Son is being clothed in the garments of the Father. He was taking off the clothes of a servant and putting on the robe of his dad, the robe of the Father. He was also given a ring, which is a symbol of authority. That was how they signed something back in the days. They would put in a wax, and that's how they would sign and seal something. This was a symbol of authority. And then he was given sandals, which was a sign of wealth. You know, servants, they didn't wear shoes in the house. Only sons did. So the son has requested the status of a servant. He's been denied that, actually. He's been restored as a son. Our natural reaction when we know we've sinned against God is to try and work it off. But God will have none of it. You can't know God that way. You have to know God on the basis of grace. And where is the shame from what the son did here in the story? It's gone. The only one who experiences any shame in the story is the father as he runs for the son. And where is the punishment here in the story? Where's the punishment in the fact that he blew all his money on prostitutes? Again, there's not a single drop of it. Again, who actually pays for the this, this son's reckless living? Again, not the son. The father absorbs it. Instead of shame and beating and humiliation, there are robes and honor and parties. The sweetest, richest word in all Christianity the one people find even hardest to believe is this word grace and grace. So let me explain why this whole story is really about Jesus' death and resurrection. It's not a cute story about how God brings you back when you're lonely and makes you feel warm and fuzzy. The cross was Jesus running after us, taking upon himself our shame. The cross was filled with shame. In Deuteronomy, there is a verse that says, Cursed are the ones who are hung on a tree. When Jesus hung on the tree, everyone thought that Jesus was cursed by God and died in shame. He was beaten, spat upon. He was stripped naked and received the cat of nine tails that had the pieces of bone and metal and glass, which would embed itself into the skin and shred the skin. He received nails in his hands and his feet. It was so painful, men would actually weep and vomit and urinate all over themselves as they go through this process. The Romans would crucify these people naked in a public place, too. It'd be like if you went to the mall today and saw people hanging on crosses, and naked and beaten, 
and ashamed. This was Jesus bearing your sin and your shame. Again, do you understand what the cross is? It's Jesus taking the place for rebellion and your way we're living. The cross for many people in our culture is just a decoration, a symbol of their faith. But the cross is everything. It's God bringing you back to him. The cross is not a decoration. It is a declaration. It's a declaration that though you and I deserve condemnation, Jesus took it all in our place and offers us the restored intimacy of sonship if we choose to receive it. The resurrection, which we celebrate this morning, was Jesus making all things new. It is where Jesus took the garments of our sin and put them away in the grave and clothed us in the robe of his righteousness. The resurrection is where he gave us the ring of new life, authority to overcome sin and corruption, authority and ability to put our families back together, to escape the curse over our own life and make all things new. The resurrection is where he put on our feet the sandals of our, our privileged position with the Father so that we can come boldly into his presence like sons and daughters. Is the most that we can hope for that we can go back and hope to be a servant. But God says no. He says, no, you are my son. You are my daughter. Because Jesus died the death that we deserve. If the cross and resurrection are not true, then this is just a quaint story with no real meaning. But if, this, if they are true, then it means that God is the true prodigal, the one who spent until he had nothing left. Again, who ran to you? Who gave it all up for you and now offers to clothe you in power and grace? Again, if the cross and the resurrection actually happened, it means that there are none of us who are beyond the reach of of God's grace. No sin is too wicked, no country too far, no recklessness too severe, no shame too great, no corruption too advanced, no pigsty too filthy. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. If the cross and resurrection are true, your history does not have to define your identity or your destiny. Your future is not defined by your past mistakes, but by the promise, promises of God. A God who makes all things new and clothes you with power. If the cross and resurrection are true, there's nothing you could do that would make God love you more. There's nothing you have done that makes him love you any less. It's a gift that you simply receive. I've heard grace be defined as this of God's riches at Christ's expense. You get the position as a son or daughter because Jesus, God's perfect son, paid the price of your rebellion. Again, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Let me finish the story here. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he had heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. So he answered his father, look, all these these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And God also loves you when you're too proud to receive his grace. And this brother on the surface looks like the opposite of the younger son. He's good and upright, but subtle detail, he's actually outside of the house. The father actually has to go out to him. And Jesus has a very specific person in mind in telling this part of the story. It's the religious person. 
who has lived a good life and thinks that, you know, God owes them because of that, but has never really experienced God's grace and has no relationship with God. This brother is not like his father at all. He hates his brother. He may be near the house of the father, but he doesn't have the heart of the father. Do you ever notice that religious people sometimes can be some of the most unloving people on the planet? Maybe if you're self-righteous and unforgiving, many of them are haters. Maybe some of you in this room and even watching online have been victims of that. That's because religion cleans you up on the outside without changing you on the inside. And that's what you see with this older brother. It's cleaning up the exterior without changing the heart. That's what happens when you try to clean yourself up on your own. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Following religion is like filthy rags. Where religion doesn't actually change the heart, only leads to pride and just more filthiness in our lives. But what God wants to change is your heart. And that can't happen by you resolving to do better yourself. It happens when you experience God's grace and he makes you more like him. The grace of God for you is what creates that new heart. It makes you like the Father. But here's the good news. God loves you during that time when you're too proud to receive his grace as well. You know, sometimes we have a hard time seeing this. We believe God loves the wayward sinner, but he also loves the lost religious person too. According to Jesus, two people miss the gospel here in this story. The rebellious that never submit to God as well as the self-righteous that don't understand how desperately they need his grace. And this leads me to my last point this morning, is that you can choose to stay outside of God's love forever. And the, the story never actually resolves, does it? It ends abruptly in verse 32. Does the older son receive his father's, father's invitation and come back in, or does he stay outside? It doesn't say because the story is it's in itself an invitation. It's an invitation, too, from the true prodigal God himself to the rebellious and the self-righteous person to come back to the Father because the Father stands there with just open arms. And will you receive God's offer of pardon? And God won't force that on you. You have to choose to receive it. And so here's my question this morning. Can have you had the very simple experience of receiving Christ into your life? Have you had the experience of understanding that what Jesus did on the cross and what he did through the resurrection was for you? Have you had the experience where you could say, I see myself in this story. That story is about me. And have you had the experience to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Again, this offer is between you and the Father who created you. And so I want to give you a chance this morning to receive Christ if you never had. And so will you bow your heads with me this morning? If you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never surrendered to him as Lord, I would invite you just to say something to God like this if you want to. It's not a magic prayer, but it has to come from your heart but you can use these words if they reflect your heart. So if this is you, you know, feel free to pray this silently after me. Again, Lord Jesus, I receive your love and your offer of salvation. I receive your love and your offer of salvation. I believe in the resurrection, and that means that you are Lord and are in charge, and you call the shots. And let me me say that again. Lord Jesus, I receive your love and your offer of salvation. I receive your love and your offer of salvation. I believe in the resurrection, and that means that you are Lord and are in charge, and you call the shots. If you prayed that prayer, I encourage you to, after I close out my message, my sermon and prayer during this next song, just to come down front. I'd love to greet you and pray with you and celebrate with you this morning. And will you pray with me as the worship team comes, comes forward? Holy God, we confess that we have often failed to accept your invitation. We've wanted to go our own way. 
we've needed to figure things out on our own. Either through our own misunderstanding or through the failed witness of others, we've often misunderstood what you are calling us to. We've run from you because we thought that you were a, a hard taskmaster or that you wanted to make our lives boring or lifeless. We really thought of the grace that you've offered us as an opportunity to live lives of celebration and rejoicing, a banquet, a party celebrating your goodness and redemption. So whether we've run away from your grace because we wanted the life we could create for ourselves more than the life you have for us, or even if we've been good religious people who've been so stuck on following the rules and being good Christians that we've forgotten what it means to truly feast on your mercy, help us to enter your house with fresh love, fresh grace, fresh joy. And let the party of your grace begin when we begin our relationship with you, God. We pray this all in the name of your Lord, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.